What's up everybody, Tom Fazio here. Welcome to the channel. If you're new, welcome back. If you're not, by request, by popular request, sparring footage. I may be making a critical error here, we will see uh, shortly, but I'm, I'm aware that I'm exposing myself to uh, probably even more criticism than normal. But hey, you requested it, I can accommodate a little bit, but I do need to frame what I'm gonna share with you guys. So look, put out a lot of content around soft weapons, critiques are always normal, never work in a real fight. Um, you know, fancy, flashy, nice choreography, but not a chance in hell, blah, blah, blah. When we're talking about the long range rope dart stuff, hey, I agree with you. And I'm gonna put out another video shortly that talks about realistic applications or even realistic uh, ways of framing that type of a tool or a weapon, right? I don't believe it's a self-defense weapon either. So we're in the same camp. Some of the stuff that I do in terms of the close quarter self-defense stuff, this is a different category. And if you don't understand some of the foundational principles behind the, uh, especially the transitions and the intercepts, you're never gonna believe the techniques. So I, I specifically put out a few videos last year, it's been a while now, looking at some of the interceptions. I'd highly recommend you go back and visit those. Um, and they're in fact the reason that I'm doing this because I was really impressed with the level of commentary in the comment section. Now I don't have a big channel and those videos didn't get a ton of views. But hey, I'm doing this because we have great conversations and we can grow together. And that is awesome incentive to go a little bit deeper, even if I'm pretty aware of what may come. So let me frame this for you. The footage that I have, um, <laughs> a big surprise, I and most of the people that practice martial arts don't record every sparring session. And I don't spar often. It's been, you know, I've been in the countryside of Vietnam now for over four years. Haven't done a bit of sparring at that time. Um, and before that, it's, you know, it was sporadic for, for many, many years. But look, you guys got to realize, people that have been in the game a while, sparring is critical. It has its role. But the longer that you do martial arts, there's some stuff that you, that you can carry forward from prior experience. And it requires very little kind of, you know, re-upping, right? Case in point, I, I uh, you know, I, I, by the way, about 30 years of training now. So when I'm saying, you know, I don't spar all the time, it's not like I've got four years of practice and it's all simulation and no fighting. I used to fight and I used to compete 20 years ago, all the time, you know, seven, eight times a year and in point fighting, a little bit of a, a little bit of full contact. This was normal, right? Um, unfortunately, it was before the days of current mixed martial arts in, in the way that we have it now. If that stuff was around, I probably would have entered that at some point. Um, but yeah, I kind of, I went through that process ahead of some of these things. But, you know, we got our sparring, got our fighting in for sure at that time. Now what happens is you do enough of that, but then you keep training. It informs how you adopt new skills and practices. Not every skill that you practice needs full contact application to understand it. Um, I had a, a chain whip instructor, my second, Master Wong. We practiced in, in Ganzhou, which is in the south of China. Not Guangzhou, but Ganzhou. Trained with him for about a year, uh, some classical weapons and uh, chain whip stuff. And by the way, my wheelhouse was not in wushu. People look at my videos and they're like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty, but would never work. That stuff is a hobby for me, right? <laughs> Most of the focus that I did was much more along the lines of, of Korean and Japanese style martial arts for the first decade. And with that, a lot, of, a lot of application work, a lot of fighting. Also practiced Thai boxing practice with MMA professionals in Hong Kong, military combatives instructors, practice with a lot of the application hands-on stuff. But what he said after I asked him, you know, I don't see you guys fight a lot. I don't see you spar a lot. I mean, how do you, how do you translate that to a weapon like this? And his answer was super simple. He said, I use my intelligence. <laughs> okay, at the time I thought it was a joke. I laughed. He, he didn't smile. And I was like, okay, he means that. I need to think about this a little bit. And it took me some time to understand that um, 
you know, for those that don't know, people that grew up in the Shaolin Temple, and he was, he was uh, a Shaolin lay monk when I met him, but he grew up in the Shaolin Temple, national Wushu champion, extraordinary martial artist. They fight. I mean, they fight every week. I mean, it's part of the curriculum, right? So you learn all the forms, you learn the Wushu forms, you learn the weapons, you do all this stuff, but these guys are constantly getting hands-on experience. Now, they may not carry on the fighting applications forever. You know, they get their hours in with that, but it's Sanda is it's pretty hardcore. I mean, it's full contact. And with that, you have a reduction in techniques, right? And people are always saying, well, you know, what about, wh why don't we see this in MMA? With MMA, you are dealing with extremely skilled and aggressive fighters. And when you are dealing with people of this category, you have to deal with a reduction in skill set. Because as volatility increases, the complexity of the applied moves has to decrease. This is something, and I'll do another video on this, but this is something that all of us have to keep in mind when we're learning skills. If you are not, in some cases, exponentially more skilled than your opponent, if you're dealing with high levels of aggression, you're not gonna be able to apply the majority of those techniques. Now, the reason that people practice martial arts for 30, 40, 50 years is because, well, eventually you get good enough, right? You get good enough at controlling your stress response. You get good enough at applying more nuanced and fine motor skills under pressure. But for people that have five years of experience, 10 years of experience, it isn't enough, right? So when you're listening to these guys on YouTube that are talking about why certain martial arts don't work, or I did Aikido for 10 years, but then I went up against an MMA guy and then it didn't work. Well, yeah, I mean, that's not, you've got no experience with actual aggressive physical confrontation. You've, you had no application for your skill set. Now you take somebody that has those skills and somebody that has five or 10 years of full contact, that's a different beast. I've met guys like this. Maybe I am one, who knows? But uh, you know, it takes a long time, so you can't underestimate that growth curve. And you know, just because we practice skills that may not apply in the cage with gloves you know, in that specific type of environment, it doesn't rule them out as being valuable, especially, especially if you've got kind of a, a mental familiarity or connection with those movement mechanics, those strategies, right? We can't underestimate the value of having personal connection to certain types of, of movements and strategies. It's important. So long-winded, sorry. Let me get into this. Um, the video I'm about to show you is light sparring, okay? Two reasons. I don't film all my sessions. This one happened to be filmed while I was doing the rest of the filming for my DVD set, The Art of the Sash, where I look at uh, you know, long range and close quarter fighting applications of, of this stuff. But it's important to note that we might, we might break sparring, quote unquote, down into a few different categories. Entry level, level one, we might call Hosensul, or this kind of choreographed simulations, if-then statements. If they do this, you do this. So they throw a punch, you practice block, counter, reset. Block, counter, reset. Block, counter, reset, right? And people could watch that and say, well, that's great, why don't you hit something? Well, you should do that kind of shit for years to program in the kind of, uh, the insight, the perception of the movements, learning the body mechanics of your opponents, doing it with different people of different sizes. You know, you get, you get good at reading the mechanics of the hips, the shoulders, the distance. That's why we do that kind of practice. It's critical. And it's probably, for the first five years, it's probably the most important work that people could do. So much more important than the fighting. What happens when you put people under pressure and under stress is they start to prematurely filter their tools and techniques. So once they start to get nervous and fearful, they go back to basics and the basics always work, right? The jab, the cross, you know, the roundhouse or the turning kicks, I mean, the basic techniques. But if you initiate, if you, if you kind of instill that fear response and then you start to filter movements, yeah, you're doing stuff that works, but does that mean that's all that works? No, you just, you never got beyond those early entry skills. So there's a whole lot more. So next level, next level we might call, uh, you know, narrow range kind of feeding techniques. And we call these like known techniques, right? So this can happen in, in martial arts practice or in boxing practice. In boxing practice, the, the, the guy with the mitts might say, I'm gonna feed you a jab, I'm gonna feed you a cross. When I give you a jab, I want you to parry counter. When I feed you the cross, parry counter. Super simple. This could be a little bit more complex, but it's, it's an intentionally narrow ranged of scope. You have a response, they have a specific attack. Now you're trying to work with these. So, okay, there's more than one, right? This isn't host and soul anymore maybe two, three, four techniques, and then I have set responses. Why? 
to kind of instill those reactions, right? That muscle memory. And this is critical for now increasing the complexity of my responses. Next level beyond that, we've got, you know, that was a narrow range, might be feeding techniques. Then we've got wide range, also feeding techniques, but they're unknown techniques. So what I'm gonna show you in my video is a combination of the two, right? But this would be the type of case where we say, okay, you know, you're gonna feed me whatever you want. Kicks, punches, maybe you try a few takedowns, I'm gonna respond as best I can, but you don't continue to, to apply that pressure and aggression if I, A, execute a good technique that quote unquote scores a point, or if I fuck up. I mean, you just don't keep going, you're not trying to take me out. I'm trying to intentionally apply what I know in a controlled situation, but this is a higher level than just those few techniques, right? It's free form, but there's an understanding of the limitations. Now, these three, in my opinion, over the lifetime of a martial artist are probably the most valuable hours of practice because they would allow you to apply what you're doing in, kind of in form-based practices or, or structural practices into moving opponents under a little bit of pressure and volatility. Now, I'm not discounting the need for full contact or high pressure training. We absolutely have to do it. But if somebody wants to get up and running in five years and get into a cage, well, then yeah, the pressure testing is more critical early on. But the problem is it will cause you to filter out potentially valuable and, and really kind of, you know, the types of techniques that can be yours and that you can really own because of the way that you think, the way that you personally deal with and address conflict. And to be able to express yourself through physical movement without the fear of, well, getting you know, jacked up right away is critical to developing higher level skills. And this takes, I'm sorry, it takes decades. It takes a very long time a lot of practice. So next one. Then we get wide range, you know, efforting, wide range resisting, meaning come at me with whatever you want, but don't give me the techniques. Now we're in kind of soft sparring, right? This is what most people want to see, like how does this play out? Let's let's put our techniques to the test. This can be super useful for flow-based practice, right? If we're engaging now, it gives me an opportunity to say, okay, he's not giving me the techniques anymore. We're working against each other but it's not such a high level that I have to worry that if I try something new, I'm gonna get knocked out for it, right? It gives me that window. Um, and this is kind of on the border there between you know, really refining your techniques and applications and now starting to filter what you do because stuff breaks down. You're either not good enough at it or the pressure of the circumstance dictates that the, the movement doesn't scale, right? It works in theory, doesn't work in practice. Sometimes we can't know that until we're highly skilled, right? But those are the two issues. And finally, full contact, free sparring, you know, no holds barred, everything goes. Um, a lot of people wanna see this. Not gonna do that for you today, apologies. But look, the value that that brings, it's if you want to be able to handle yourself on the streets, if you want to, especially if you wanna fight in competition, it's critical to do pressure testing. It's critical to do full contact fighting. I would argue that over the lifetime of a martial artist that this type of engagement, it should be minimized because of the damage that it can do to both you physically, but also your psyche. It will deter you from growing in as many ways as it develops, right? So the key is, in my opinion, to implement it, you know, sporadically, make it meaningful, make it count, but don't do it so much that it forces you to reduce your growth to a narrow subset of skills that just work all the time. You know, it's like narrowing your, your, your vocabulary or your grammar to those things that just a rudimentary level because it always works, you know? And then as soon as you wanna communicate at a higher level about something more meaningful, well, you're, you're screwed. Why? Well, because when you tried it the last time, you sounded like an idiot and maybe used the wrong word. And so if you beat somebody down too quickly, they're just, they're not even gonna try to adopt those skills, okay? So, all that said, final point about this particular, <laughs> as you can see, I'm anticipating uh, comments about this, but um, the last point, weapons training, the sash. Um, I have done this at a higher degree. I've never done it with full contact fighting, for which if somebody asked me, I would say, apply your intelligence. You've done full contact fighting. You've got your skill set. If you have to use it, use it. It's not the type of thing I would recommend anybody go and use, but would I be confident enough against an, a non-professional 
assailant to use a weapon like this, I would. I've got hundreds of hours of application work with this um, over the years, right? And this was relatively early in my training and application. I've got a lot, a lot more time since. But what you have to keep in mind is that when you're going with something like this, the sash, we could say knife, we could say sword, we could say staff, we could say any of these things. But the sash in particular, once you apply a cinch, if the opponent is still resisting, you will wrench the shit out of that arm and you'll pop, dislocate stuff. And there are those guys that say, this technique can't be practiced because it'll kill somebody. This won't kill somebody, but it will maim them or it will temporarily dislocate something. I get, you know, people are surprised when they feel what this can do the first time. It feels like even though it's a tight location and it might ring a certain part of the arm, neck, head, you would be amazing how quickly it binds and chokes, how quickly it, it just feels like your arm is going to get ripped off. And I'm not trying to exaggerate here. Everybody that I've worked with has said the same thing. I felt it myself. Um, it's startling. And so when, when you're dealing with a full contact scenario or an aggressive scenario, I'm moving one way. If my attacker is resisting and he doesn't go with the flow, the damage that it could cause would not be worth the risk of training. So that's where I'm at. So take that for what you will. But this level of engagement is more than just straight simulations. I'm saying throw what you want. But now he is, he is filtering the types of things he does because we've had a long, this is at the end of a long day and he knows how it feels to go through this stuff. So, um, but I don't know the exact technique. Uh, I'm working, uh, you know, trying to fit my techniques in. We do the best we can. Okay, so I'm going to play this here. Right. So just letting this play, you, you can see there that we both are using a rarely narrow, I mean, he's mostly striking. I didn't say just strike anything like this, but that's where we're at. So he's throwing the techniques, I'm parrying. And so what I will say is this, right? People will look at this and then they'll watch a, te a, a technique tutorial and they say, oh, that'll never work. The, any weapon that you use needs to be an extension of yourself. Now we all know that, that adage, right? But it needs to be applied, meaning, just because you have a knife, just because you have a sash, whatever you're using, it doesn't mean you turn your brain off. You have to find a way to integrate that weapon within the whole system, within your skill set. So I'm still fighting, man. I, I got my parries, I got my kicks, I could still fight. I have all those options at my disposal and, and the particular way my style uh, and approach to using the sash, one, one wrist wrap, the other one free, I can get into all of my applications from this and it still gives me the freedom to strike use all the other tools and techniques, right? So it doesn't limit me in the way that a lot of people would assume. And so you see a technique and say, oh, that'll never work. It's like, well, so you gotta look at how it's being applied. So I've got all the standards that you might look at, but then how do we integrate? And obviously when, when, this, when I get the cinch, he complies because for the reasons I mentioned, it's awful. And while I'm guiding him through techniques that he, he knows how to receive, you have to keep in mind that if I, I wasn't using techniques that he was familiar with and that I didn't want to use standard lines, I could wrench and, and react and alter the course of the strike or, or alter the course of the lock very quickly and, and make it a lot more devastating. And there, there was an immediate intercept, right? We come in, so a lot of you guys have seen you can do relatively easy arm break. If you're good enough to parry a strike, right? The hand is coming in, you can parry, then you're good enough to do a destruction. If I can parry and strike, then I could snap the arm at the same time. Don't try that at home. Not very nice, um, but I'm just applying that with the sash here, and it's it's a technique that you can do hands free, but the sash can enhance it in some ways. Okay, and sloppy reaction on my part. A few times, just letting it roll. Okay, so I had a decent entry there, got into a a choke. Now it's important to keep in mind is. When you're trying to practice and learn a tool, you're going to make mistakes. I'm showing you some of my thought and mistakes along the way. This is a uh, relative, I mean, I'm going to shorten it a little bit, but it's a relatively unedited video and take it for what you will. Now, if I didn't have the sash on, I'd be dealing with all of my skill sets and not trying to think about applying something new. It'd be a totally different situation. 
I'm going through this where I'm saying, okay, I'm still trying to apply a new tool. And with that, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna eat punches, you're gonna eat kicks. That comes with the territory, and that's why you practice in this kind of you know, watered down, modified um, training to really filter that out. And the better that you get, I mean, this was almost 10 years ago for me, and I kept on doing this for years, right? You get to a point where it integrates even better and you don't eat any shots, right? Because you, you get beyond the thinking process, right? So. Yeah, you can hear my frustration there. Now, that was a pretty sneaky uh, wrist wrap that I snuck in in the middle of the punches. And this is a good example of how you can integrate these techniques uh, more subtly, right? Now, two points that I've mentioned, pausing it here. Two points I mentioned in some of the transitional videos. Super subtle and difficult to see, right? The one that I just did, uh, it included a, a technique that I would call following or sticking. Meaning, he extended the punch, but what you don't see is I, I, I blend the intercept and the wrap within his retraction. So the right punch is coming out, I parry, I blend and guide that technique to the outside, which is doing a few different things. I'm moving away from his free hand, right? So he's got to, to pivot or turn additionally to be able to connect with that. So I'm eliminating that. I'm guiding him in a way that upsets his, his physical structure, which, which buys me more time. It's these, these transitions that make a big difference. And a few moments ago, when I applied the uh, outer wrist lock, but it's an outer form lock with the sash, I used a technique that we would call pressing, right? Which, which means if somebody's striking in with, let's say the right arm, the technique doesn't just, I'm not just, you know, the flash and super fast wrapping that arm. I need to press and extend. So as this is extending, you circle or, you know, in Aikido, and if you're lucky with a hop Keto instructor might teach this, but it's more common in Aikido and traditional, like a white crane, these techniques are pretty well assimilated in the transitions that they work, you know, the techniques themselves, but they're not easy. So as the technique is extending, what happens when I start to apply pressure into, into the wrist? You know, obviously I'm extending, it's gonna help me hyperextend and lock out that arm. What happens then? Well, it's gonna take my shoulder with it, and if I start to circle, it's gonna dip. So it's a complex that guides, presses, and starts to manipulate the structure from initial contact. It's super subtle to see. You know, if you don't have uh, experience feeling and applying this, it just, it doesn't look real. And I get that, and I'm trying to explain it for some of you guys that, that you know, are trying to do maybe some of those types of techniques in your practice. It doesn't mean they don't work. You gotta be, familiar uh, with the transitions and good enough to be able to apply them. But once you do, it's a game changer. And so what you can see is here, he doesn't know the techniques that I'm trying to apply. I don't necessarily know what he's trying to apply. I'm missing plenty. But the ones that I'm getting, he's not able to follow up very well with more follow-up techniques because I'm immediately manipulating the structure, moving away from his free hand and setting myself up for that counter in the process. It's all blended, right? Okay, knee press is what it is, inside of the knee, buckles most people. Not much there, a few paris, pretty sloppy. Okay, so still trying to think, where, where do I see a technique that I can work with? Right, so in dealing with weapons, um, the more skilled somebody is with that tool, the more integrated the tool is. But if you deal with somebody that's inexperienced and has a knife, for example, and I'm not trying to make this sound easy, this is dangerous stuff, but if somebody has a knife, there's two possibilities. That person is skilled and is able to integrate with their, their whole being and, and they've got other tools and techniques. Or that, that tool becomes the mind, right? They've got one intention, stab, kill, whatever it might be. The mind is on the tool. That's it. So if you are defending yourself against that, you need to pretty quickly assess, is that person's sole intention on this? Or does he have other things that I need to be concerned with? Not everybody will. Sometimes you give, it's interesting, you give a novice a knife and they'll forget all the other tools that they have at their disposal. It's super common, which is why this takes a lot of practice. So having that knowledge can allow you to manipulate an opponent that has a tool if you can see quickly that his mind is the weapon. He's got nothing else that's going on. That's what he's thinking about. And on the other hand, if you're carrying the weapon, you've got an enhanced edge, literally in this case. You can use that not only to stab slash puncture. It can be a distraction tool, 
right? So it doesn't need to be your sole focus. You know you've got other tools and resources at your disposal. So I'm trying to communicate here is that you'll notice that not, I'm not trying to get every entry, every application, although I am trying to work my applications. And that's part of this. That's why this is not uh, the host and tool type, right? This is not the simulation. I do a ton of that work and it's not full contact. It's somewhere in between where you get to make the mistakes and you get to explore and, and see what techniques work and scale and so on and so forth. Okay, so I just went in and attacked that outer wrist lock. Can still kick, can still punch, miss the entry, happens. Got the entry on that one, and that was just the sticking technique into the higher uh, shoulder lock, right? Outer wrist lock entry we've already discussed. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Arm bar, not tight enough, right? Just exploring, right? You gotta, you gotta give yourself room to make mistake on, uh, on these types of things. It's gonna happen. Okay, so he's throwing, you know, he's trying to get his punches in there and again, entering where I can on the, the outer wrist lock. I'm trying to reduce my entries and my skill sets to a, a few that I can consistently execute. We got the head spin here, just the entry. I demoed that in my uh, Art of the Sash video. Okay, low kick. Got lucky there, snuck it in, got the entry. Took my time with it, but uh, that over the arm bar, you could tell that my entry there also included a stuff of the shoulder to prevent him from striking, right? And the, and the second one followed up uh, stuff of the hand to prevent him from striking, right? And then we went over the shoulder. So you can integrate other types of traps and stuffs. And here we go with the, uh, you know, kind of the arm bar or the outside shoulder lock. Going with the outside wrist lock. Getting cheeky, downward hook kick. Okay, so there's the end of that video. Got one more. Forty-five. Forty-five. All right, we still integrate the kicks. Extending here a little bit more. Entered with the arm bar. So I'm being a little bit more aggressive in this one. I'm moving around a little bit more. So the last one you might have said that was more kind of a level two sparring. We could consider this a level level three a little bit. He's throwing more techniques, but I'm also moving more. I'm not staying as stable. Leg press, silly as it is, his hand was on his punch, his hand was on striking my head, his leg was open, obviously. Some people can shoot, but look, you're on the streets, you may not want to go to the ground, you may just want to take the person down, it's okay. Um, simple outside rotation there. So what I would say is in a lot of ways, the sash makes the lock easier, but the transition harder. So now we got a downward trap. I discussed this principle in one of the other videos. <laughs> that didn't go well. Okay, downward trap. And he's, he's following up, right? So, so this is a good point, right? So now, you know, some of the ones in the demo that I do are the downward trap and then the rotate. Uh, there's a few good techniques from this downward trap. The reason this works is because I'm, I'm drawing uh, his technique forward. So he's striking similar to the inside uh, parry and the circling technique. This one hits and it drags, right? So it breaks that person's structure, it extends the limb. Uh, it buys me a few seconds, but you can see here, if it's not hard enough or fast enough, he may be able to follow up with another technique, right? So there are actually <laughs> organic techniques that you can do with a follow-up technique. You can rotate the elbow over, get a double wrap, you can 
duck, move, knee, uh, put a knee down, and then just continue the technique just to give yourself that little bit of extra distance. There are ways of dealing with that, but it's good to see here that you know, as you're working through it, yeah, it's a, people see this quickly. Oh, but he's got another hand. Oh, but he can kick you. Oh, he can knee you. Oh, he can shoot. Of course, guys, it's practice, right? He can do anything. So the point is, how do we start to assimilate this in a way that gives you that sophistication and that insight and all the skills that you have, you know, without limiting you? The tool should not be a limitation. It should be an enhancement. To do that, you've got to do a lot of, you know, application work. Okay, so there you can see I tried to go for the double wrap. Missed. Pretty easy on this one. I slipped inside the jab, went for a basic takedown. You'll see similar takedowns in uh, judo and jiu-jitsu. That one I got, I got the wrap, but I <laughs> was too close and struck him in the process of the, the rotation. Okay. And so for the people say, yeah, look, it works with a small guy, it doesn't work on a big guy. Yeah, the big guy's not gonna fall well. The difference is it's gonna wrench his wrist, his shoulder out, depending on the type of technique. And uh, there's no way that person is going to be able to adapt and move as quickly, which is why you need to use guys that are agile. The only way to get out of some of these techniques is to go with them so that you don't lose your arm, your wrist, your shoulder, right? This is why guys learn to break fall. It's very, it's fundamental in falling arts. Okay, so I'm feeling out his techniques. Again, if I wasn't trying to apply the sash, my, my defense would look a lot sharper than it does, right? I'm constantly thinking, where, where is the entry for the tool? Because that's what I'm trying to develop. Take the sash out. Yeah, I mean, look, I've been doing this a long time. A lot of these basic types of, of striking are not, it would look very different at this pace, right? That's all I'm saying. We missed some of the entries, and that's okay. We just set up, we go again. Sometimes you get them. I jerked down to see if I could go for the leg wrap. Didn't work. He reset. I, I found another uh, weak point in his structure. Just pulled. That's okay. Could always follow it up with a kick, a stomp, anything on the ground. Choke. Follow it up. I'm in this one another. An arm drag. I get the wrap. I drag. It's not the end of the technique, guys. You can continue. Apply your jujitsu, right? So, um, yeah, cue the comments. Um, I'm sure there will be many. You know, this is, a, this is some raw footage, right? And the premise of this, just so you're clear, the premise of this was not for me to show how cool I am or to defeat my opponent effortlessly. There was one purpose. This video was filmed at the long, uh, you know, after a long couple days of filming back in my studio in Shanghai. The intention was to just so, show a little bit of the application work of the, all the techniques in the DVD but more free form. So the, the techniques, I break them down and say, you know, they do this, you do this, here's the application, you can work through it. But you have to see what it looks and feels like when it's a little bit more fluid. It doesn't always work, you know? Just the, the same way that if you've got experience practicing any martial art, you know that you look a, a bit foolish for the first couple of years fighting somebody that's a little bit more skilled. You make mistakes, you're seeing stuff that doesn't process or register, you've got those brain freezes and, you know, part of the process, okay? So, there you have it, a little bit of sparring footage. I know it's not full contact. I know it's not the, uh, the most exciting footage in the world. But I, I thought it would be better to make it more of a tutorial and, uh, you know, or, or instructional, you know, something that you could take away a few points from. Um, and yeah, I think to, to wrap this up, I would just say this. It doesn't matter if it's this tool or any, any other type of weapon. On, on the one hand, use your intelligence. You need enough familiarity with the tool to be able to wield it well, which is why we practice in flow arts, especially we practice sequencing to be able to understand how to move and adapt to the weapon. You don't need to do that when you're dealing with stuff like a staff or a sword. Those are relatively linear types of tools and weapons. You don't swing and then the sword continues and can cut your head off. That happens with a sash, it happens with a rope dart, etc. Understand the tool, get in your stress testing, your pressure testing. Uh, on the side. And then if and when you ever have to use it, trust yourself, right? You might still fail. You might be on the street. You might be trying you know, to apply something. You might still fail. Again, this is something that I might integrate if I could clearly see that I outclassed my opponent. It's not something that I would start to pick up and wield if I was like, this guy's got years. Like he's well-structured. 
extremely aggressive, he's a natural, if I started to see these types of signs, I'd say, well, I need to revert back to a, a more minimal skill set. But what's the advantage of this? The advantage is obvious. It gives you instantaneous binding, control, and wrapping, right? Binding, wrapping, control, however you want to, to, to say those. But it gives you instant access to that, right? Whereas somebody that might be trying to apply certain jujitsu techniques, uh, you know, takedowns or grappling techniques, this gives you incredible leverage if it's applied properly. So if there was somebody that was, I could tell quickly, wasn't structured, wasn't as skilled, might be throwing wild, wild or blind techniques, there's an opportunity. And if not, guess what? It's a piece of fabric. You drop it, right? You don't have to use it. It's, I mean, come on, it's not like that. So if it, if it enhances what you do, you apply it. If it doesn't enhance it, leave it behind or let it be silent, right? In a lot of the movements here, I might've been striking, might've been thinking through, just doing a few basic techniques so he knows, okay, I can do other things. In his mind now, I'm, I'm setting, setting a precedent. He doesn't only have to look out for the sash, he's gotta think about these other things too. But it can be silent. You can have a silent knife. You can have a silent, probably not a staff, it's a rather big tool, but these weapons can be silent until they're not silent. You can take them out, apply them when you need them, um, but as a reserve tool. And that's a powerful angle, right? So anyway, hope this was helpful. I know it was a long, a long-winded spiel, but hey, this stuff is not basic practice. It's not something that anybody should think that I'm trying to say, yeah, learn this, and in two months you'll go on the street. No, 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 no. Uh, I've got, at this point, almost 20 years of experience with soft weapons. My close quarter and grappling applications, and I've got almost 30 years, of, uh, 25 years of grappling, 30 years of martial arts, 25 years of grappling. So I was able to apply that knowledge to the sash, and now I've been doing the close quarter work for over a decade. So this stuff takes time. And, you know, if you want to get good in cage fighting, this is not, it's not relevant for you. If you want to explore the broad spectrum of martial arts and learn how, you know, the advantage of these things is they open your mind to options and ideas. And it gives you the chance to see that the things that are around you, even that, you know, even maybe even your primary tools, there are creative applications that can enhance what you might know and what you can do. And that's, that's the great advantage. And you might not use them ever. That's okay. So guys, uh, thank you for the high level conversations in the comments. I do appreciate it. This is for you if you've been one of those guys. Much appreciated. Um, and I'll see you in the next one. Be weightless.